And uh, if the if the hotel's burning down now, it's my last story I tell before I die. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure it's not. So after the Wales game, we're having a few drinks just in the hotel. And um, the fire alarm went off at five in the morning or something. And we all, you know, as you do, you think it's a false alarm, whatever. So we all just headed down quickly. Cornell didn't even have his shoes on. It's pissing it down with rain. And this guy, the guy behind the counter has got his, says fire marshal on. It's, he's having a time of his life. This is his moment. This is his moment. He's like, get out of here, get out of here. Like, oh, there must actually be a fire. Okay, lads, time to deliver. Amazon delivers you the rugby. The Autumn Nations Cup, live on Prime Video. I can't allow that. Great chatting to you, and we're in the mix of another tournament, right? Which is classic, we can get onto that. But let's just talk about one thing that always gets flagged up. It happened to me a lot. Um, it, it happened to you a lot when you were getting all your man of the matches and you were talking on TV. Hamish Watson, the man with the most Scottish name, but with a more English accent than myself. So have you got any justification for your Scottishness or do you want to get out there to the haters why they're questioning why you've got an English accent? I'm more Scottish than you, I know that much. In what way? Um, but actually, you, you know what, sometimes the name, yeah, it is a bit embarrassing with the name because it's Hamish, it's actually Hamish Fergus Wallace Watson. That's very Believe posh as not. well, that's too posh. Yeah, so my mum's maiden name's Wallace as well, so it's, um, it's a very Scottish name for someone with, like you say, an English accent, but Obviously, I was brought up in England, so that's the reason for the accent. Is... We played together, but I remember you being a good player, right? And obviously had some really good attributes, but speaking frankly, mate, you're more than a good player now. Like, you know, last year, and we can talk about the Lions and stuff like that, you know, you were up there with some of the best back rows in the world. Like, why is that? Is that because you've evolved your game or is that because the, the kind of game has come back to the way that you want to play in terms of ball carry, in terms of just being as physical as you can. Yeah, I think we when do we I think we played together in that um, the 2015 World Cup and that why, why are you smiling? Why are you smiling? <laughs> I didn't play the World Cup, the game before. No, yeah, neither did I, but the game before, you know, the Italy and Turin, wasn't it? Of course did we won. Yeah, exactly. Pumped them. <laughs> I think we beat them by like two points. We played more uh, than that though, didn't we? Was that your first game? That was my second game. My oh, first really? game. All right. Yeah, my first game was in the Six Nations before that. So that was my second game. Um, I don't really know what it is. I don't know whether it's um, whether rugby's changed a bit. I know definitely when when I was coming through at 18, there was probably still a big emphasis on trying to get the biggest pack you could. I know that was sort of going around world rugby in the forwards pack. You wanted the biggest, strongest guys out there. I don't think it sort of changed. It, I don't know whether it was just it's changed over time, but it, it's... Uh, it's definitely changed now. I think you still need to be pretty strong to play rugby or pretty powerful to play rugby, but there was probably a tendency back in the day just to look at people's height and look at people's weight. And then if they didn't hit those targets, they wouldn't even look any further. Do you know what I mean? Especially at a young age when you're trying to find an academy or trying to find a system to go into after, after school rugby. And they might just look at those two things and think, oh, well, no, that's not good enough. When, when I watch you play, Ryan, it's maybe the stars have aligned because the game has shifted considerably even since I've retired you know three years ago and you, you look at the different kind of body shapes is there anyone that you look at in the world rugby and I know it's a pretty weird question asking the guy who's at the peak of his game or do you look at anyone and be like right he's set the bar as a back row you know Sam the Hill the way that he tackles you know Michael Hooper because he's small and stocky and probably a similar physique but do you look at anyone in the kind of back rows around the world and be like that player is the complete package Someone I used to really look up to when I was still playing, because they sort of played, um, they sort of played as I was breaking onto the scene. I actually ended up playing against him at international level as well. Was Sean O'Brien? I think definitely he was. He was a player I really looked up to. I loved the way he played. Obviously, big physical ball. He's obviously still playing at Irish, but he's sort of fallen off the international stuff a bit and had a few unlucky injuries. But that was someone who I always wanted to uh, play like a big abrasive ball carrier, um, and then was great over the ball as well. Uh, he's obviously. A lot bigger than me as well, but he's not he's not super big, I suppose, for a modern day back rower. But he's still he's still a pretty big guy, and uh, probably another one I, I do I did like Tipperick. Not that I don't like him now, but when I was young, you know, when you tend to play against these guys now at international level, I suppose it's a bit different. You don't you don't look up to them in the way that you probably did when you were nineteen and trying to break through, because I think he broke onto the scene pretty early. Whereas for me, it took a bit longer. Um, so I don't have anything against Tipperick, but obviously when you start playing against them competitively, 
you sort of um you have to be competitive and I suppose a bit of arrogance and think actually they're not quite as good as you thought or vice you have to have that edge about you or otherwise you're doing the wrong thing you know what I mean but when I was definitely younger uh coming through that was another person I really looked up to so those two um those two are two players that um that yeah made me want to play in the back row I suppose when I was at like 20 or so no absolutely interesting just talk a little bit about you go back a, a couple of couple of years I mean I don't even know what year we're in or when when it was it was the World Cup so it was last year last season um you picked up a nasty injury right you were I would say would you say you were in the form of your life in the lead up to that I mean I remember you getting loads of man of the matches is that how you is that how you you measure someone's performances is by getting man of the matches but I think for you personally you're playing so well but you picked up a nasty injury how long were you out for with that because it seems for you to take a while to get back from that yeah I so I was I was on quite good form, obviously with the man of the match thing. You you, you never really know. Sometimes you get the man of the match, or you come off thinking I did not deserve that at all. So, and other times you think, flip, I should have got man of the match there, and you're nowhere near it. So it's a man of the match is not really, it's not really um, a scale of it. But um, but yeah, obviously went to I went to that Japan World Cup on fairly decent form and uh, did my knee in the first what after forty. I don't even know if I made it to half time. Maybe after thirty five minutes. So it was quite lucky in a way. The silver lining was that it was only my medial ligament. So when you do your knee, everyone knows that you can do your ACL, which is probably the worst, or do you do your ACL, your meniscus and your medial. You hear people doing all three. So it was lucky in that way that I only did my medial. So it put me out for four months. I think my first game back was mid-December. So it was, it was gutting because I, obviously 2015, me and you didn't get in the World Cup. Uh, you obviously should have done. Um, I always and, said, mate, two-step lob, we, we would have beaten <laughs> Australia and who knows what would have happened against Argentina. Well, there you go. You would have been a hero. But so it was gutting because it's something you aim for to go to a World Cup and you look forward to it. And you, you um, when, you're, when you're on fairly decent form, it is something you're really looking forward to. And it, it was gutting to end the way it did. But yeah, four months later, I was back playing and who knows, maybe, maybe I'll get on another one. We'll have to wait and see. Have you noticed a shift with Hoggy... And Johnny Gray playing at Exeter, obviously Finn being Finn, but playing over in Racing, who, who are a superstar team. Have you noticed a shift in the culture of the squad? Yeah, definitely. I think you need, I think because you, we've only got two pro clubs in Scotland, you need these guys to go away and get different experiences. And the winning is good because that winning mentality, And but the guys, what they've gone and achieved and won the double is all, is a bonus because obviously it shows how good they are and being in that winning environment. But I think you also need players from all different clubs to bring together their experiences. Everyone comes in with new ideas. You know, you've got obviously Sean Maitland as well at Saracens, who's had that for years now. Uh, people like Cornell Dupree coming in from Worcester. I think it's just really important to get loads of different players from different environments so they can all bring their own take on it. In, instead of just being from Glasgow and Edinburgh, we do two pretty similar things. Uh, so Hamish, Awesome Nations Cup. Like how's that? How's the build-up been to that? Italy first up this weekend. How are you looking at that? I mean, I actually was really surprised how good they were against England. And we know, well, I know certainly how big them games against Italy are because they see Scotland as a game that, you know, historically they've won matches. Yeah, like you say, we're, we're all pretty excited about getting a new tournament. It's, it's just trying to put, we, we have put that game aside now. The Wales game, it's in the past now, it's done. And it's all focused on this, this new tournament, Autumn Nations Cup. And a chance to win a bit of silverware as well. Uh, obviously, you've got to take each game as it comes. Obviously, like you said, Italy away from home is, is a tough game for Scotland. It always is a tough game. They get they get the they get the puggy up for those games, and um, we we have struggled away from home to Italy. So it's going to be a really tough game. And like you say, they played they played really well against England compared to I think they looked a bit rusty in that Ireland game, and then against England, it, it, the score probably flattered England a bit. So, uh, yeah, it'll be a tough match and I think it's really important to, to win that one. And then we've got two home games and I think it's then the finals weekend. So I think hopefully we're, we're aiming to top the group and see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And all the talk's been around the fly-half position. Finn has got a groin injury. I don't know how bad it is. It didn't look great, but he's out for the tournament and Adam Hastings, uh, a long-term injury. But you look at the interaction around yeah. Dunkey Weir coming back into the team. He's not just loved within Scotland, but it just seems like the wider community, everyone's jumped on the kind of donkey wear bandwagon. I don't know whether it's the hair, but we know that he's a quality player. How good is it having him as a kind of third choice tenant, as you like, to be able to come in and do a job? 
yeah, it's funny. He's a bit of a folk hero all around, all around the whole of the UK. So it's great to have Dunkey back in. You know what Dunkey's like, the sort of environment he brings to the group, even outside the pitch. Never mind on it. So it's it's been good to have Dunkey back into the mix, and he was obviously in the Six Nations squad as well. But now he's got a, he'll be really looking forward to it because he's got a chance to sort of make that starting jersey his own and and then see what happens when when Finn and when Finn and Adam come back. But I'm really looking forward to playing with him again. Played them at Edinburgh and played a few Scotland games with him. And it's like you say, to have someone like Dunkey, who is still so experienced because he started playing at such a young age, you forget what Dunkey's achieved and how experienced he is. So it's it's good for him to to come back in and have someone as experienced as him as your, like you say, your so called third choice fly half. And, uh... <laughs> God. Hotel's burning down. Well, I'll tell you a story. The other night was dreadful. It was after we beat Wales, we came back. The viewers were having a few drinks, yeah. And uh, if the if the hotel's burning down now, it's my last story I tell before I die. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure it's not. So after the Wales game, we're having a few drinks just in the hotel. And um, the fire alarm went off at five in the morning or something. And we all, you know, as you do, you think it's a false alarm, whatever. So we all just headed down quickly. Cornell didn't even have his shoes on. It's pissing it down with rain. And this guy, the guy behind the counter has got his, says fire marshal on. It's, he's having a time of his life. This is his moment. This is his moment. He's like, get out of here, get out of here. Like, oh, there must actually be a fire. Anyway, so we're out there for about an hour. Eventually the fire department rocks up, nothing wrong. So by this time it's six o'clock. Boys, boys are waking up. Absolutely hanging. Mate, if I was state manager, mate, it wouldn't have happened, mate. We'd be in the western in town. Now one of the boys just lighting a fag in their room, I think. There we go, mate. Hey, probably Finn. We'll blame him even though he's not there. <laughs> Rory Southern, but he burned the toast. That's <laughs> oh, my God. How is it when you're playing? See, when you're playing against Wales, and we've played in Wales, if you are played in Wales loads, and everything is about the atmosphere and the experience. What's the interaction like with the lads? Like, you know, in training, where you train, and you just kind of get on... You know, you get on with it. You used to, but you know everyone. Like, how is it? You know, you're packing down from a scrum, and there's obviously you're waiting around. Is there any really chat or not? Is it just? Is it? Just, yeah, I don't know. Can you hear that, it on TV? Bit? Can you hear that on TV? It's just because I I keep thinking I'll be able to hear everything, but we talked about it quite a bit because there is no fans. When you get a penalty or when you score a try or when you do something something positive for the team, it's just trying to g each other up and build that buzz as much as you can without the fans there. So it is it is a bit like you know a bit of clapping, a bit of whooping, just trying to build anything, which normally would be a bit nausea. The Maro, the Maro Otoji, you mean? The Maro Otoji whooping. You've got, you've got to do it to build that sort of vibe and try and get there. I remember at one point during the Wales game, it must have been like 15 minutes in, we got a scrum penalty. We're acting as if we had just won the championship and Gareth <laughs> Davies was like, chill the hell out, lads, or something like that. And we were like, well, <laughs> I know, you know what I mean? It's just something that you probably wouldn't even normally hear because there would be loads of fans so the other team wouldn't normally hear that. Now, there's a Lions tour at the end of this season, if we talk about it like that. When it, we don't even know what season we're in, but there's a, there's a Lions tour potentially in the summer. Is it something you as a player and the players chat about? Because I almost think in the media, and I'm hyping the boys up, I'm going to be pushing for you lads to go, right? Because I genuinely think if you make noise, they have to take, people have got to look up and listen. And I know the results will back that up and we've spoken about that. But for you individually, and then looking at some of the quality that we, you've got in the Scotland team, is there talk about the Lions? Not, not as a group or... For Scotland, we'd love to get as many players going on tour as possible. There's not much talk about about the Lions, to be honest. It's it's more crack, if anything, to take the piss out of someone if they've been mentioned loads on the Lions tour. So it's more um, it's more a bit of that, a bit of banter. But I would say the thing about it is, I suppose, if we keep on good form and keep performing, keep beating teams like Wales and finishing above them in the Six Nations, then I suppose it becomes a lot harder for Lions coaches to ignore the fact that they're taking no Scotland players, but you're beating these teams. So if we in if we in 2021 finish, finish second, finish first, finish third, and finish above other Lions teams, it's hard to ignore the fact that, hang on, we've beaten these teams, but only two Scots have gone on tour, but we've beaten, and, and how many, you know, whatever, 10 Welsh guys, 10 English guys have gone on tour. How why is that if we've just beaten them? I suppose it doesn't always come down to just winning. They might, it, we might be on a really good roll and hang on, they have actually got really good players. So it might not just be down to that, but it makes it very hard for coaches to suddenly ignore that 
um, if we are winning games. Whereas if we come in fifth, sixth, it's pretty easy for them to be like, well, no, that's why we're not taking them. So I think it comes a bit down to that. And come this time um, and come our form, hopefully we can keep it going and make it hard for coaches to ignore Scotland players. But we'll see what happens, mate. It's a long way away, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, no, absolutely. I'm going to be pushing for the lads anyway, because not just yeah, because... No, I, I think you deserve it. I think you look at the quality of performances and, you know, frankly, there's an evolution and there's a change of guard, it seems. You know, England are always going to be the team that they are. Wales have fallen off the wayside. It's just an evolution. That's what it is. And watching you lads perform and, and, and play well week in, week out, it's class to watch. Um, lastly, I'm getting a load of stuff coming to my DMs, right? After games, Scotland games, during the games. And as I live my life through social media, it seems, during lockdown, Oh, my lid is what a lot of people are saying about Hamish Watson. People are direct messaging me about your hair, your lid. Are they messaging you or not? Come on, take the hat off. Let's have a look and tell us what it is. Oh, I know what the lid's looking like, mate. Mate, we'll just, I'll tell you. Take, take the hat off and let's have a look. It looks very American. It is. It's a bit, it's a bit long, mate, but... A bit? What is it? Because we know the Exeter lads like to do these... Well, every, I say Exeter. They almost started the trend of... I don't want to say it's a shit lid, but it's, a, it's an interesting... What I mean... Is it mate, a I've, been, I've been rocking this lid since 2012, mate. So I know, but it's it's fairly long, mate. I don't know. I need to actually. The problem is, I need to get it all cut on top as well to actually get it properly cut into a mullet. It's a bit of like a, it's a bit of an old school old school mullet at the moment. It's a bit long all over. Is um, it a mullet though? So when the, when the people are asking and they'll probably watch this, the millions out there, is this is this a mullet that, that Hamish Watson has? I don't know, mate. You you can answer that, can't you? I don't know what it is. I this. I, I'll give it a I haven't. Back. I haven't cut. I haven't. I haven't cut the back of my hair since my wedding, and that was um, in June 2019, first June 2019. So that's I haven't cut it for what a year and a half. And then before that, I had the mullet as well. But my wife obviously made me cut it for the wedding, and then so that's that's that. I don't know. I quite like having a the back of my hair quite long. It works, mate. With the the headband and the tape and all that, mate, it works. It's like Hamish Watson, like signature court figure. So, mate, I love that. Good luck in the up and coming games. And, uh, mate, I'll keep pushing for the lads and you keep doing your stuff out there. Loving it. Well, I want you to be a team manager, bro. What about team manager? I'm team manager. Are you pushing for that or what? Yeah, we'll try it in four years' time. We'll see what happens. Okay, lads, time to deliver. This November. Amazon delivers you a brand new international knockout rugby tournament. The Autumn Nations Cup. Live on Amazon Prime. I can't allow that. Go again.